I'm here today with Amy Jill Levine. Amy Jill is University Professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies and Mary Jane Worthen Professor of Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt University. She's also affiliated professor at Wolf Institute, Center for Jewish Christian Relations in Cambridge. Her books include The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of Jewish Jesus, which was Publishers Weekly Best Books of 2007, also Short Stories by Jesus, The Enigmatic Parables of a Controversial Rabbi, and The Meaning of the Bible, What the Jewish Scriptures and the Christian Old Testament Can Teach Us, along with Douglas Knight. Her children's books with Sandy Sasso include Who Counts, 100 Sheep, 10 Coins, and Two Sons, also The Marvelous Mustard Seed, and also Who Is My Neighbor. Um, and these books, I might add, are all recommended on the Commercial Christianity Children's Book page on our website. Um, Professor Levine has held office in the Society of Biblical Literature, Catholic Biblical Association, and Association for Jewish Studies. She served as Alexander Robertson Fellow at the University of Glasgow and Catholic Biblical Association Scholar to the Philippines. Oh, this is just going along much too long. Let's just, let's just talk. <laughs> One more. In spring 2019, she was the first Jew to teach New Testament at Rome's Pontifical Biblical Institute. So in any event, that, that's a short version, Amy Jill. I mean, uh, there's a longer version that I could have read of all the other accolades that you got. So in any event, it's really an honor to have you with us today. I really appreciate you uh, spending some time with us. Thank you. Happy to be with you. So um, before we dive into, um, you know, what we're going to talk about today, um, maybe you could tell us briefly I just learned that you have two new books coming out, one that just came out in August and one in October. Could you give, give us just a brief um, preview of those two? Oh, thanks for asking. All authors are happy to be asked about <laughs> the publications. Um, I, the book that came out uh, at the beginning of August 2020 is on the Sermon on the Mount. It's a beginner's guide to the kingdom of heaven. Um, it's designed to take some very familiar material uh, the Our Father prayer, the blessed of the poor in spirit, the don't cast your pearls before swine, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The Sermon on the Mount is basically Jesus' greatest hits. But what it tries to do is, is defamiliarize these texts. They become so familiar that we've lost their punch. They've simply become cliches. So to try to determine as best as we can what these lines would have sounded like uh, spoken by a Jew to a group of Jews, you know, perhaps on a hillside in Galilee or, or in a local synagogue. Um, <coughs> what are the connections to the scriptures of Israel that Jesus is evoking? How is he understanding the Torah? In fact, how is he making understanding what God wants us to do more rigorous rather than just saying, you know, don't worry, be happy, love God. And No, I mean, he's actually giving deep instructions, how to avoid hypocrisy, how to do an internal checklist to figure out if you're on the right path and doing it in a way that's not only profound, it's also entertaining. So that's what I tried to do there in the Sermon on the Mount book, as well as to strip out a number of anti-Jewish interpretations that have found their way into the sermon's um, reception history over the past 2,000 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other book that's coming out in October, um, which I'm very, very excited about, I co-authored with Mark Brettler. Uh, Mark is my co-editor for the Jewish Annotated New Testament, which is a huge project. Um, what we did, and we got interested in this while working on the Jewish Annotated New Testament, is all these quotes from Genesis or Isaiah or the Psalms or uh, Deuteronomy that show up in the New Testament. Um, but those texts have additional meanings. So that if Matthew says, this was done to fulfill what was said by the prophet, well, if Isaiah makes a prediction or a statement in the year 700 or so BCE, it had to have meant something to Isaiah's audience. Because if you say to a group of people, 700 years from now, it's all going to be fine, it's not really good news. So we thought, let's go back and figure out as best as we are able to determine what those texts meant in their original context. Let's see how other Jews of the time of Jesus are reading these texts, whether from the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Jewish historian Josephus or the Jewish philosopher Philo. And then let's push forward into rabbinic Judaism, post-New Testament Jewish sources, to see what else those ancient scriptures meant to people who read them. And we thought this was a particularly good time for such a book because today, um, when we see the same phenomenon, person X interprets it in one way, person Y interprets it in another, and then suddenly we demonize the person, we say it can only have one meaning. How do we look at the same text which has been read so differently 
by Jews and Christians and try to see through each other's eyes, we might conclude at the end, I don't agree with you, but at least I can see the rationale by which you got it. We can determine that the text has more meaning than any one community can determine. And then we can ask, what does this text mean to us today? So it's a big book and we worked really hard on it, but we think we found something new here in terms of showing different communities, this text that is so familiar to you, other communities read it differently. You might wanna talk with them and thereby you'll learn something about them and you'll also learn something about yourself. Well, what a concept. I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic topic and very timely. And um, I mean, obviously even just within the Christian community, there's vastly different interpretation of the same words, you know, from the Bible too. So I think that, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of things we can learn from the examples I think that you're including in that. So we'll look forward to that and we'll look forward to learning more about it, um, you know, coming soon. Super. Thank you. So, um, you know, leading up to the election, it's probably one of the most polarized times our country has been uh, politically, but also racially, theologically. Um, what, can you talk a little bit about what loving your neighbor as you love yourself and doing to others mean to you? Yeah. Um, I think they're very good starting points. Um, so that when the, when Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount summarizes uh, the law and the prophets with um, do to others as you would have them do to you, um, or later on in the gospel of Matthew, the gospel where the Sermon on the Mount shows up, um, he gets asked what commandment in, in Torah, what commandment in scripture is the greatest? And there are 613 from which to choose. And he comes up with Deuteronomy chapter six, which is love of God and Leviticus chapter 19, which is love of neighbor. But you can't stop there because if you use either of these on their own, they are both open to, to massive types of abuse. If I begin with the idea of love my neighbor as myself, then I risk imposing on my neighbor what I think is of value, but my neighbor may not. Um, it's love of neighbor that prompts missionaries or prompted missionaries to say, well, what, what would I want to have done for me? I would want to be a Christian, so therefore, I'm going to go out to indigenous populations and not only proclaim the gospel, I'm going to take kids away from their homes, um, refuse to allow them to speak their own language, refuse to allow them to worship their own gods and force Christianity upon them. So to do unto others as you would have them do unto you risks imposing your own views on them rather than asking the other what they might want. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to go past these, these slogans and, and get to the real meat of what people actually need. So this one-liner soundbite Jesus or soundbite politics really doesn't get us anywhere. We have to go back and say, well, what exactly do you mean by that? And can you give me an example? And here's a counter, how do you deal with that? Um, uh, in terms of um, love your neighbor as yourself, that also risks that, that same sense of imposing. Um, what I find here is that a number of my Christian students misread that and they say, oh, um, well, Leviticus says, love your neighbor as yourself and a neighbor means a fellow Jew. So Jews only care about Jews, they don't care about anybody else. Oh my goodness. But, but that's another one of those problems of sloganeering and looking at things through a tunnel. Because if you go on in the very same chapter in Leviticus, chapter 19, it goes on to say, you have to love the stranger who dwells among you, the resident alien, you know, the, pers the person who's, who's not a citizen, right? You have to love that person like you, because you were a stranger in the land of Egypt and you knew what it was like to be displaced. Um, so this idea of love, it, you know, we, one of the things we need to realize is there are neighbors and there are strangers there are citizens and there are visitors or guests, but they both deserve love. So rather than mush everybody into the neighbor category, we might be actually better off in thinking, you know, there are US uh, citizens and there are Canadians. And the Canadians are lovely, but you know what? They don't get to vote in our election unless they've got some sort of joint citizenship, right? But <laughs> yes, you'll have to love them. And that can be expanded to a variety of, of nationalities and ethnic groups, as we know. So your work has been very attractive across religious lines, across you know, a variety of different faith traditions. Why do you think that that's the case? <laughs> well, I'm delighted that it is. It's always good to have that for you. Absolutely true. <laughs> um, 
I try to treat religions, both my own, um, and, and I'm Jewish, and, and we Jews can be extremely self-critical, um, and I am, uh, but I try to treat any religious tradition on which I am working with enormous respect. Um, you don't have to be a believer to treat somebody else's tradition with respect. Um, and at the same time, when I disagree with a particular view, then I will explain why I disagree or say, I understand how it might work for you, but here's why it doesn't work for me, or here's how I would approach the same problem, but from a different lens. Um, I grew up in a predominantly Roman Catholic neighborhood, and my parents raised me to have deep respect for the Roman Catholic tradition. And my friends, my, my friends loved me, and they were terrific. And when I was a kid and I would go to church, which meant going to mass, Mass was just like going to synagogue because it was a bunch of men wearing robes speaking in a strange language I didn't understand. <laughs> it was kind of the same, just that mass was shorter than Saturday morning services in the local synagogue. Um, I also realized that um, I'm in a very, very privileged position. Um, I, I speak to fellow Jews as an insider, um, but I, I also respectfully disagree with some of my fellow Jews in terms of what they what they believe, because Jews don't always agree on the same thing. I mean, you know, the old line is two Jews, three opinions, which I as a Jew can say, but, you know, Christians. <laughs> um, so that I know when I walk into my synagogue, there will be disagreements on um, uh, do we like the rabbi's sermon? Right. Uh, how do we feel about the state of Israel? Uh, what do we think about uh, mandatory education regarding the Shoah? Um, what kind of horseradish is the best that you can find? I mean, the <laughs> interesting thing is debate, right? Um, so you stay within the system and you love the system, but you realize that, that, that there are places where you need to have these conversations. When it comes to Christianity, um, my mother once explained this. My mother was a very, very wise woman. And she said, it's easier to be an infidel, in other words, a non-believer, than an apostate, a believer who left the system, right? So if I'm speaking particularly to conservative Christians and I say something they like, it's, well, even the Jew gets it, so it must be true. Um, and if I say something that they don't like, it's, well, if she's Jewish, what does she know? <laughs> um, and what I'm trying to do is, is work things out historically. So as an historian looking particularly at first century Judaism within which Christianity, what becomes Christianity as we know it, um, takes shape. Jesus is Jewish, Paul is Jewish, Mary Mag, they're all Jewish, right? Mary Magdalene is Jewish. Pilot, not so much. Um, the, um, I'm doing history. And, and that's open. You don't have to be a believer or a non-believer to do history. You just have to, you have to know the sources, you have to know the languages, and you have to be able to make a coherent argument. Um, and in part, what I'm doing is, for Jews, I'm recovering part of Jewish history, because Jews don't know the New Testament. We, we go from the Maccabees in the second century BC up to the Mishnah, um, in the year 200 or so common era. So it, the New Testament's a fabulous source of Jewish history and, you know, thank God the church preserved it. Um, so that's recovering Jewish history. Um, and for Christians, I'm saying, you think Jesus is important? I, as an historian, can tell you how profound he was. Um, you might read Paul in the following way, but I, as an historian, can tell you your readings of Paul might be incorrect because you don't understand first century Jewish history. And if one doesn't understand the historical context in which Jesus and Paul and Peter and James and all the Marys, because they're all named Mary, lived, um, then we're going to get them wrong. And if we get them wrong, we're likely to come up with an anti-Jewish reading, and you don't need to make Judaism look bad in order to make Jesus look good. For Christians who were somewhat disaffected from the church, as, as many of them are, or who can't accept certain doctrinal concerns, uh, whether it's uh, the incarnation or the resurrection or some of the, the, the various other miracles. Um, I, as a Jew, and I'm not a Messianic Jew, I'm just your ordinary Jew Jew who happens to know a whole lot about the New Testament. Um, I, I can, with full sincerity, say that I think Jesus is a brilliant teacher and everyone can learn from him. So if I don't need to make Judaism look bad in order to make Jesus look good, neither does the church. Let me show you how to do that. Excellent. Excellent. That's awesome. So one thing that kind of I, I honestly surprises me a little bit, you, you've written these incredibly um, intellectual books, right? You know, the types of things that you've been talking about. And for adults, you know, uh, and you've written for children. Yeah. Right, you know, which, which, you know, at least it superficially is a, seems like an incredibly different genre, style, audience, everything. So tell me a little bit about 
why you've done that and how you do that. <laughs> right. Well, when you begin by saying something, like you've written all these intellectual books, it sounds like, like they're, they're, they're high shelf stuff and you have to have at least a master's to get there. Um, well, and you are a university like, professor with all these different, you know, accolades academically, so, you know. Oh, yeah, and, you know, like, I can do that, and I can do the whole <laughs> academic stuff, and I can talk about the eschatological concern regarding the delay of the parousia in light of Christological developments prior to, Nice prior to the Nicene Creed, right? I mean, you know, I can do all that stuff, and I can throw in some German to make it sound even better. Um, but when, and I've written books like that because I've written books that are targeted toward the academy. And sure. I've written articles that are targeted toward the academy. But in the books that we've been talking about, like the Sermon on the Mount book, or like the book that I've done with Mark, we've particularly pitched this to lay audiences who are interested in knowing more about uh, the academic study of religion, but they may be dental hygienists, they, they may be um, gardeners, uh, they may be you know, retired nurses, whatever. Um, my target audience for, um, for this type of, of book is actually my mother-in-law, um, who did not graduate from college and who, before she retired, sold carpets for the Sears Corporation, right? So I figure if my, and, and who grew up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, right? So my dear is if my mother-in-law can get this, th th then I'm okay, right? <laughs> She's a smart woman, but she doesn't have a whole lot of background in this particular field. For the children's books, um, my co-author, Sandy Eisenberg Sasso, um, is a noted children's book author. Um, she's, she's also a retired rabbi from Indianapolis, um, and she's fabulous, and she's been a friend for years. Um, and one day I was lamenting to Sandy, because I lament a lot, which means I complain a lot, or in Yiddish, I kvetch, right? Because there's a lot to complain about. So I was complaining about the lack of really good books designed for children in church contexts. Because a lot of children's books about Jesus are either boring um, or they're obvious, right? You know, the Good Samaritan means you're nice to your neighbor, and the prodigal son means God loves you even if you make a big mistake. I mean, kids get that all the time. And some of them are just anti-Jewish. And I thought, we could do better. So I thought, okay, Sandy, the rabbi, but the children's book author, and... Amy Jill, AJ, the, the Jewish New Testament professor. We're, I said, we can write a children's book. I know what to say, and you know how to say it. <laughs> That's great. That's a great way and, to look at it. Uh, and we thought we'd do it on parables, because you can, you can read parables without necessarily believing that Jesus is Lord and Savior. All you have to do is, is recognize that these are good stories, right? Um, and the parables, they can be read as being about Jesus, right? They can be read actually autobiographically, but they don't have to be. And traditionally, in fact, they're not. So I had written a book about Jesus' parables called Short Stories by Jesus, and I thought, we'll take some of those parables, and we'll turn them into children's books, and we won't dumb them down, because kids are smart, <laughs> and kids understand what it means to be fair, and kids understand what it means to be ignored, and kids know what it means to be little, and, and so you can't do what grown-ups can do. So we won't dumb it down, we'll just change the language such that a four-year-old or seven-year-old would be able to understand this. So we wrote this book on, the first one we wrote was on the three parables in Luke chapter 15, the parable usually called the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. And we turned it into a counting book because kids need to know how to count, right? There's a sheep owner who has who has 100 sheep and he loses one, so you've got to count up the sheep, right? Um, and there's a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one, so you've got to count up the coins. And there's a man who had two sons. And he actually, if you read the prodigal closely, has lost both. And then it's a question of, of how you count up your people, how you make everybody feel counted. So we, we thought we had a counting book. We had Luke 15. It was brilliant. We can't get the thing published because no press, and we went to Christian presses, <laughs> no press is going to take a book on Jesus' parables written by two Jews. <laughs> In fact, I went to one press, um, and in, in a number of these presses, they had actually published my adult books, sort of academic books. And one of the presses, I know the acquisitions editor, he's, he's a really good New Testament scholar, and I said, how about this? And he read it and said, this is great. He couldn't get it through the editorial board, so I said to him at one point, should I change my name to Mary Agnes? You know, would that get the book through? <laughs> it didn't work. So I have, I have a very, very dear friend who used to teach at McCormick Seminary, the Presbyterian sure. Seminary in Chicago, and is now here teaching at, at Vanderbilt, named Elizabeth Caldwell. And Lib Caldwell said, 
send it to Westminster John Knox, the publication uh, venue of the Presbyterian Church USA. And I thought, okay, I, I think I can do that. Um, I wasn't sure the Presbyterians were talking to me uh, because I had come out publicly against their, um, their um, uh, published material on the state of Israel. I, I thought it bled over from criticism of what I thought legitimate criticism of um, settlement expansion into just basic anti-Judaism. So I didn't think they were talking to me. Um, so I sent them this thing and within 48 hours, Sandy and I had a contract for two books and then they issued us a contract for another two books and we've got a fifth one in the works right now. So God bless the Presbyterians, <laughs> right? Awesome. No good stuff when they see it. And they've been fabulous to work with and they have found us excellent illustrators. So we've done uh, The Prodigal Son uh, we've done the Good Samaritan, and it kind of, the illustrations are, um, they're shapes, um, yellow and blue shapes. It looks like SpongeBob meets, meets the Good Samaritan, and, and it really works. And there are really good puns in there for adults if they can appreciate. We've done the Mustard Seed, and we just published one that's actually not a parable. Um, it's based on a retelling of the, uh, the creation narrative. So Genesis chapter one, and the one that's in the works right now is the parable of the fig tree in the gospel of Luke. Mm. And what happened, I get notes from Sunday school teachers when children have questions, <laughs> yeah, which is really nice. Like, did you name the sheep? I think that's <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what did you, what are the names that you gave to the prodigal son and his older brother? How come you didn't give them names? Why does, why does the younger son have red shoes? You know, all sorts of questions that Sandy and I have never considered, but <laughs> what we're hoping is that these books would, would, would prompt kids to ask questions of their own. And, and at the end of each book, we have a note to parents and teachers and caregivers saying, here's how you read this book with your child. Here are the questions that you ask your child. Here are the prompts. Have you ever felt? Um, what do you think about? If you were so-and-so, how would you feel? And when it comes to some of these parables that have trailed a certain anti-Jewish interpretation, we've also said, you may have heard that. That is an incorrect anti-Jewish reading. Here's what's really going on historically. So the adults, therefore, will not read these stories with, with Christian children and say, by the way, the Jews thought, and then start inculcating Jew hatred in, in five-year-olds. So... Um... My, my daughter has got a four-year-old and seven-year-old sons, and they just love your books. Uh, oh, I'm delighted to hear that. So, you know, I, I, that's why I was really, you know, thrilled when I knew I was going to get an opportunity to, uh, to speak with you, because I know they're going to be thrilled, you know, the fact that uh, we were going to be talking. Uh, but roughly, when is the new children's book coming out? Um, the, the, uh, a very big problem came out also in early August, so that's the newest one. Um, okay. And... And the next one, um, probably sometime in late 2021, because it takes about 18 months to get these things through. So we've got the contract, Sandy and I have turned in, and we turned in one version and we've got the editorial comments back and we've turned that in. So now we're waiting to hear from the press to see what are the next steps. Will they accept it as it is? Is there anything else that we need to tweak? Excellent. Well, we'll definitely be looking forward to, to, to that. Uh, we'll find out more. Good. Oh, um, the, um, the, the first one, the, the 100 Sheep, 10, 10 Coins, and Two Sons, that's actually coming out as a board book. Oh, um, and I think it's called, I, I don't remember the name of the title. They just came up with it, but it's something like The Lost Sheep um, or The Man Who Had a 100 Sheep. But this way you can get, you know, little kids who like board books. Sure, sure. To play with it. So it's, it's an, it's, I, I love this. It's a children's version of my children's book. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Well, just to, um, to finish off, uh, what kind of advice do you have for new writers? It's really hard. Um, I'm an academic. So when academics go into, into publishing, there's a sense that we've already paid our dues, that we've, you know, we've, we've published our articles in vetted journals. Um, we've given papers at conferences. We've tested our work against other people and, and we've been judged accordingly. We, we've been told if our faculty has, has been kind to us and appropriate, where we need to be better. Um, so when I started doing stuff on the popular level, I, I had already had a background in academic publishing. And that's different if you're a first time publisher and you're not an academic. Absolutely. 
So, I, you know, you actually are in a better position than I am to provide such advice. But when people do write to me and they say, you know, I, I've read your stuff and I'd really like to do something along the following lines. Here are some of the things that I've suggested. Um, tr try to remember that you may have a target audience, but other people will read your book. You may be targeting liberal Christians, but a conservative Christian or a Jew or an atheist or a Muslim might read your book. Don't say anything that will hurt those outside people. That's always a risk. Um, uh, when, when you write, try not to write in gross generalities, because in that case, Christians think, uh, because you're going to turn people off, right? So Christians think that, you know, abortion is a sin. Well, yes, some people do, <laughs> but there are Christians of good conscience who think that women should have the right to choose, um, in particular, if, if the fetus is not going to live for more than a day or two outside the body, right? Um, so try not to generalize. Try to write from your own experiences. Um, this happened to me, as opposed to this happens to everybody. And try not to speak for the majority. All women think. I had a professor um, in graduate school who would look at me and say things like, Mrs. Levine, he always got that one wrong too. Mrs. Levine, he would say, what do the Jews think about the epistle to the Galatians? You know, first of all, the Jews don't read the epistle to the Galatians. And, and, and second, if they did, they would have various opinions on it. <laughs> So, you know, try, try not to speak with these generalities. Try to speak in such a way so that people can understand what you're saying. Um, read your stuff out loud. Because when, when you write, sometimes your syntax can become extremely convoluted. If you read it out loud and you suddenly realize you're writing like Faulkner and your sentence is going on for three pages, you might want to pull back a bit. Um, talk to people who will give you legitimate criticism because they love you. And don't talk to somebody with whom, you know, don't talk to somebody who's going to give you what they think you, you want to hear. Talk to somebody who will give you what you need to hear. My best critic is my husband, right? And every once in a while, it's like, mm -hmm. I know you love me, but that's really hard to take. But I know you're doing this because you love me. And, and invariably, he's right. Um, so don't think when you first do it, it's perfect. When Sandy and I put these books together, and we do this all by email, because I'm in Nashville and she's in Indianapolis, um, five iterations to start, and then 15, and then 20, and then 30, and that's one page. Wow. wow. So it, it takes an enormous amount of time to write a children's book, because you have to get every word right. Mm. And then Sandy, who has grandchildren, I don't, I, I have grand dogs. Um, Sandy tests the books with kids. Right? And I have friends with kids and I test the books with my friends, kids. Can I borrow your child for a little bit? You know, can I reach, you know, are you going to stay on Zoom long enough for me to get to the end of the story? So, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> really? so don't think that your first draft is perfect because it probably isn't. Keep going over it, set it aside for a couple of days or weeks and then come back to it. See if you still agree run it by friends. Uh, make sure you have something original to say, because we don't need, there's, there's a ton of books out there, right? Of the making of books, there is no end. Um, if you don't have anything that's original to say, don't bother. Um, and if the end of the book is all about you, I probably don't want to read it either. Exactly, exactly. Right? So if you're writing about Luke, I want to, I, at the end of the book, even if you're writing from your own personal perspective, which is fine, at the end of the book, I want to see something in Luke that I hadn't seen before. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow, what, what amazingly wonderful advice. Um, <clears throat> I so appreciate you uh, doing this interview with us, Amy Jill, and uh, really looking forward to the new books that are coming out. We'll help get the word out about those too. Can I plug one more book as long as we're here? Oh, certainly, of course. Just because it's relatively recent in 2018. Um, in 2018, I published a book with Cambridge University Press, which is a kind of high-end press, um, with my really good friend, Ben Witherington III. Um, ben teaches at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. It is a conservative United Methodist seminary. Um, ben is an extremely, extremely, a fairly conservative United Methodist self-identified evangelical. Uh, ben and I theologically agree on very little. Um, we agree that Jesus is important. We agree that Luke is interesting. And we both agree that the Red Sox are a fabulous baseball team. Um, but other than that, theologically, we, were, we are at opposite ends of the spectrum. 
And what we've done in this commentary on the Gospel of Luke is we've shown what biblical scholars who disagree do. Mm -hmm. So when we agree, we simply write, uh, here, here's what we think is going on. But every once in a while, or more often than not, uh, we have Ben argues that, AJ responds, Ben concludes, and then agreeing agreeably to disagree, we move on. So what we're trying to do is get people to see that the Gospels can be read very, very differently. Uh, the history behind them can be assessed very, very differently. And this prevents what we normally do today. It's become worse under COVID. We just read people with whom we agree, right? And our feeds, you know, we get sent stuff that we already agree with. And of course, we don't read anybody with whom we disagree. We just presume what they think, and then we demonize them. So people who read my stuff don't always read Ben's stuff. And people who read Ben's stuff don't always read my stuff. And we were hoping through this commentary on the Gospel of Luke, people at opposite ends of the religious ideological spectrum, uh, people who disagree on theology, um, would read this and say, oh, here are two sane, relatively sane people who really, really like each other, and they have extremely diverse, different theological views. How can this be? And then you can see through the book how it can be, and how the book that holds us together here, the Gospel of Luke, is also the book that divides us because we disagree on what it means. Very interesting. And um, hopefully a good role model for how to talk about politics, too, across uh, great divides. <laughs> that's, that's in part what we were hoping for. We didn't know in, in 2018 it would be quite as acute as it's become, mm -hmm. but we had a feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for that. I'll, uh, in the notes from our talk, I'm going to try to um, – put links to these various uh, books that you've been talking about. That would be fabulous. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Well, Amy Jill, again, thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to uh, working with you on other books, other projects, uh, other time for us to talk. That's terrific. It's been a pleasure to talk with you.